Hey, good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? How's all you Minnesota people doing with all your snow and bad roads and everything? Oh, my goodness, you guys, I feel so bad for you. Uh, we didn't get anything up here. Um, just regular, kind of partly cloudy today and stuff. But you guys all be safe and stay home if you have to. Don't be out on those roads. Um, there's nothing worth uh, risk, risking your life at all. But um, glad to see you guys here today. Thanks for joining me. Um, God bless our farm. And God bless all of you guys wherever you are today. So um, let's start in with our acts of kindness. All right. I met this gentleman in a parking lot one night while I was out picking up a few items for my home. I had just let him cross the street in front of me before parking. Once I parked, he waved at me through the window, which I then cracked so he could speak. His first words to me were, Hello, my name is John. I'm 39 and I'm gay. I won't hurt you. I don't do bad things. You're safe. I've been homeless for a long time, but this week I got an apartment with help from a group. I don't do drugs, I don't smoke, I don't drink. I'm trying to get $9 to buy eggs, milk, and bread, and hot dogs at Dollar Tree. Do you have anything that you could help with? I gave him $10, and he was filled with so much gratitude and asked if I would pray for him. Of course, I said yes, and he walked away after thanking me again. I collected my things, and by the time I had gotten out of the car, John was already two parking lanes away. Without even knowing what I was doing, I shouted, John! He turned around, and I yelled, Can I take you grocery shopping? His voice cracked, and he said, That would be really nice. By the time he got back over to me, he was crying. He told me he was scared to go into Publix looking so bad, and I assured him it was okay. We started talking and walking around the store, grabbing the items he mentioned. He didn't ask for anything else um, except for those four items that I mentioned. I asked if he had a freezer in his apartment, and he told me that he did. I told him to grab two of certain items because he could freeze things like the bread and hot dogs and stuff like that. He told me about growing up in Key West, how his mom was sick with MS, and how he had helped take care of her. She had died when he was young, and he's been on his own ever since. He explained how he'd been looking for a job but had a criminal record for selling drugs. He didn't do them, but he wanted to make money to get off the streets and had thought that that was the way. <clears throat> um, oh, that's, it. that's the end of it, I guess. I thought there was a page two, but there isn't. Well, God bless her for doing something like that. How fun, right? Um, there, um, is, uh, a friend named Harold. Um, let's see, hang on a second. Cause some of these have pictures, so I have to figure out, let's see, not the guy. Okay. I can't remember if I read this one to you or not, but let's see. How many, let's see. Oh, yeah. Nope, I haven't read this one. Okay. So, um, there, I'll just read it to you. This is my friend Harold. Not the guy in the man lift, but the one behind him in the wheelchair on the sidewalk. He stays in the nursing home across the street from where we are working. One, <clears throat> since day one, when I arrived at the job site, I've noticed him sitting there every morning from 7 a.m., he takes lunch when we do and doesn't leave until we shut the crane down and head out. I originally thought to myself, he's just a curious old man and wanting to enjoy his days outside versus being cooped up in his room. Well, after a couple of days, I got curious, so I walked over and introduced myself to him. We had a long conversation, two and a half hours worth, but long story short, Harold is nearing the end of his life. His heart valves are clogged and some disease has been eating at him for years. I don't know the name of the disease. And when he was able to work before everything had happened to his health, he was a crane operator. He said he enjoys seeing what he used to love to do for a living and never thought he'd be able to see or be around a crane again. 
and let alone be so close to see one in action. He has family, two daughters and a son who haven't seen him for the last seven years that he's been in a nursing home. So I made Harold a deal. Originally, he wanted to be put on our payroll, but as I explained to him, that wasn't really possible. So I quickly came to what I thought was a fair agreement. Our deal is this. Harold ran cranes for over 50 years, and no matter how good you think you are at something, there's always more to learn. So I told Harold every day after work I'd sit with him for a little bit so he can critique me and judge me on how I did for that day. It would give him something to talk about that he enjoys. While I, I also get to learn from him, and in return I would bring him a black coffee every morning for as long as I'm here and buy him lunch twice a week from wherever he chooses. He didn't skip a beat before he replied, Absolutely! I guess I'm writing this post because I would have never walked over to him. I would have never gotten to know him. I'm thankful to have the opportunity to make this man's last days enjoyable, filled with purpose and to be able to help smile again. Oh, I like that. Just little stuff like that, you guys. Okay. On Wednesday in Alabama, a Walker County Sheriff's Office, de office, Sheriff's office deputy came across a man walking down the road with an oxygen tank and learned he was a disabled or is a disabled American veteran trying to walk hitchhike from the Jasper area to Huntsville for a doctor appointment he was told he could not miss. With no way to get there, he said he started walking early. The deputy acted quickly and ex escorted the Gulf War veteran to the Cullman County line where a Cullman sheriff deputy picked him up. The deputy then transported him to the Morgan County line where a Morgan County Sheriff deputy took over and met a Madison County Sheriff office deputy in Huntsville who finished the trip and took the man to his appointment. After an overnight stay, we were happy to do it all over again the next day. In reverse, to help get the man back home. We are thankful for our veterans and we're honored to play a small role in supporting this man who gave a great deal for our country. Well, God bless them. God bless them. All right, let's do... Um, let's do one more here. Okay, we'll do a little bit shorter one. This fine young man came into my life five years ago. He walked up behind me with a haircut that was five months past due and a big hole in his shirt and one sock on his foot. He tugged on the back of my shirt and said, Sir, can you teach me how to play football? I responded, Son, I'll teach you a lot more than just how to play football. His response was like, Okay. I then said, Son, where is your mom and dad um, when you're at or, where's your mom and dad because football isn't cheap? He responded, my mom died and I don't know where my dad is, but my auntie takes care of me. God spoke to me that second and told me to take care of him in every way. God said to me, be a shepherd. Not knowing that day, the Lord gave me another son who would change me and him forever. I have never been more proud to sit at an eighth grade promotion as I was today. I reflected on the four national titles and all the state championships we won together. But I reflected most on how Jesus dropped him into my life like a stork from the sky and how far he has come since that day. God gave him the best aunt you could ever ask for. I love you, Marquis, and the Lord gave us four more years of high school football together. Ah, oh, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. Okay. I have a couple on my phone. <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, a mailman down by Marshall, Minnesota, um, after all the snow that you guys have received in Minnesota, um, got out of his mail truck and walked about a block to deliver my friend's uh, mail. So in return, she says, 
He's getting cookies in the mailbox tomorrow. <laughs> um, so this plumber fixed a leak at the home of a 91-year-old lady sick with cancer. And here is what his invoice said when he left it for her. Um, call, call out to boiler, high pressure, and two leaks. Amount charged, zero. Lady is 91 years of age, acute leukemia, end of life care. No charge for this lady under any circumstances. We will be available 24 hours to help her and keep her as comfortable as possible. Subtotal, zero. Total, zero. God bless you. Um, let's see. This one's kind of funny. I'll just read this one to you real quick. Our son got his head stuck in our cat scratching post today. You know, they have those holes that the cats can go through. Um, and had to have it removed by the fire department. I thought my fellow cat friends would enjoy a little laugh today. First, I would like to say our son is absolutely fine. He was not hurt in any way. I tried desperately to get him out myself, but I'm a little vertically challenged and could not lift him straight up out of the hole and turn his head and wiggle it out all at the same time. So I resorted to plan B. Fireman enters the scene. And yes, they laughed the entire time. They did a phenomenal job. I am sure it made for a much easier and more entertaining call than most that they get these days. Absolutely, that that was a funny one. Um, let's see. Okay. Oh, this one's neat. Um, my mom is my role model. Her student couldn't find a babysitter today and being the true African mother that she is, taught a three hour class with the baby on her back and fed him at the same time. I'm so blessed to be raised by a woman who loves the world as much as her own children. Wow, multitasking there. Um, let's see. All right, so I have one more for you that I have to show you. So first of all, you, I forgot to mention this the last time. See this beautiful black cup? I received it. Um, from Marla at Osnabrock Living Center as a Christmas gift. So now watch this. Hang on, I'm still with ya. Maybe you guys have seen this before. But anyway, so I'm gonna add me some coffee. And can you see what's happening? How cool is that? Isn't that neat? Oh my gosh. And then what she writes on here, she says, a pastor devoted to giving so much. God only knows all the souls that you touch. Committed to serve when you answer God's call, you prove it by being a servant to all. Thank you for all you do, Shalise. Oh, that meant so much to me, Marla. Um, wow. You know, I just try to be the hands and arms and voice of Christ. And it, it just makes it great that um, for me to know um, that the word of God, that um, he works through me to share is making a difference on some people. So thank you. I have a cup of coffee now. Okay. Um, so I have a couple of prayers. Um, prayers go out to my brother, Jeff, who just um, got out of the hospital from hip surgery, um, doing pretty good. This is his other hip. If some of you guys remember, he was the one that was in the VA, VA hospital last year for like six months or something like that and had all the problems in the world. So uh, doing good this time. Uh, please keep them in your prayers for healing. And um, 
prayers for Pastor Brad from the Synod. As I was just informed um, on, I think it was Monday, that um, he suffered a heart attack. So please send some real strong prayers out to Pastor Brad that that uh, he heals uh, real fast as well. Um, and I can't really think of anybody else right now, but God knows who needs prayers, and we are going to get uh, started. So um, let us pray. Dear God of love, dear God of understanding, and dear God of this Lenten journey, Help us to discern your still, small voice. Open us to change and grow that we may walk with Christ today and all of our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm still putting the miracles on hold, um, probably during Lenten season here. Um, but I thought it would be fun, and I was originally going to do this for church, but I'm doing something different, um, to visit some of the instrumental characters um, of Lent, Holy Week, um, kind of all that. Now, some of these we visited a couple years ago, um, but, uh, you know, doesn't hurt to visit them again. So... I'm going to start out um, with the scripture, Matthew 26, 1 through 5, uh, 14 through 16, and 20 through 25. When Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said, oh, uh, I better tell you, first of all, they are, they are at the Last Supper in the upper room. And that's where the scripture is taking place. So when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days... The Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they not they they said, We better not do this during the festival, or there might be a riot among the people. Then one of the twelve, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment he began to look for an opportunity to betray Jesus. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you here will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to one another, Surely not I, Lord. He answered, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written to him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Judas, who betrayed him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. He replied, You have said so. And also, I was going to pull up a different version of that scripture, but we also remember um, the one that, let's see, the one that kissed his cheek um, will betray me, he said. And um, that would be Judas. So, yes, yeah, uh, the kiss of Judas, also known as the betrayal of Christ, is the act with which Judas identified Jesus um, to the, uh, the government there, if you remember that. So. so the season of Lent has begun. It started last Wednesday for Ash Wednesday. For us, it started this Sunday because we canceled our Ash Wednesday service. But... Um, as we've mentioned before, it's a 40-day preparation period in anticipation of, um, first, Good Friday, and then the uh, Easter celebration um, that follows just a couple days after Good Friday. Just as we carefully prepare for big events in our personal lives, Lent invites us to make our hearts ready 
for remembering Jesus and remembering his passion and celebrating Jesus' resurrection. It's a big deal. It's a big deal, guys. Lent is also used as a time of calling back those who have become um, estranged from the church. And I'm not necessarily talking about the building, okay? The church is all of us, and some of us have wandered away. Um, so it's a, it's a time for calling uh, folks back. And as well, it's a time for all Christians to deepen their devotion and commitment uh, relationship and discipleship. So here on Coffee with Christ, we're going to spend the next um, five Wednesdays on a journey with Jesus toward Jerusalem and the cross. With And we're going to be talking about a few main characters involved in the final days of Jesus's journey. Uh, my goal is hopefully to provide you context and background as to who and what actually led Jesus to the cross. We will find answers to questions such as what were the circumstances that led up to and through the trial and execution of Jesus Christ. There can be no doubt that Jesus was executed. We know that, but, but why? And why was Jesus arrested? Why was Jesus put on trial? And why was Jesus condemned to die on the cross? So today we're going to begin our exploration and journey to the cross with the, the disciple Judas Iscariot, probably one of the most familiar um, of, of the disciples, because when we hear his name, we immediately, you know, think of his betrayal. So as I said, it, it, uh, it all starts on Monday, Thursday, when Jesus and his disciples all gathered in the upper room for the Last Supper. This supper is significant because Jesus wanted to give his closest friends and followers the most accurate understanding possible of what was going to happen next. So during this supper, they broke bread and drank wine together as the body and blood of Christ. Jesus then went to each um, disciple as their servant and washed their feet. Now, Judas Iscariot and his act of betrayal begins um, in this evening. Now, Judas was one of Jesus' inner circle of 12 disciples, and it's been said that he was really the most trusted disciple, um, ignorantly, um, and that he knew the most, you know, about Jesus because he had served as the treasure of Jesus' traveling band of followers throughout those three years of ministry. Um, as I said, he was trusted and he was loved. Um, and Judas that night also had his feet washed by Jesus and shared in the bread and wine too. So why would Jesus, I mean, why would Judas sell Jesus out? Well, nobody can be a hundred percent sure, right? But all four of the Gospels agree that he played some role in Jesus' arrest. But the details um, differ between each Gospel. Now Mark's Gospel um, is kind of quiet about it. Um, it. It's a portrayal of the, si of the silence of Judas' motives or his subsequent, subsequent fate. Uh, Mark doesn't say a whole lot about it. However, um, I think they do talk about um, uh, the fact that, you know, uh, Judas ends up committing suicide, but they don't really say why. And then Luke and John both portrayed Judas as kind of a villain and that he might have been possessed by Satan when he did this. But perhaps, like other disciples, maybe Judas was worried about where he stood in the pecking order with Jesus. He wanted to knock him off because he wanted to be the one. Or maybe he was reacting to some imaginary insult that he thought he received from Jesus and so he was rebelling. Or thought his role within Jesus' outfit wasn't important enough for who he was. Or maybe he had just lost his patience with Jesus 
and had gotten fed up with waiting for Jesus to take over the world by storm. Or lastly, we could conclude that since Judas already had a reputation for dipping into the kitty from time to time since he was the treasure, he was easily enticed by the cash involved in his payment from the Jewish authorities, the 30 pieces of silver. Now, Matthew's gospel offers a lot more details than the other gospels. Um, and here's where Matthew's version adds um, some more information that's quite interesting. Matthew tells us that Judas had received 30 pieces of silver, which back in that day was equal to about uh, 120 days of wages. And he was offered this for handing over Jesus. So maybe he was just a greedy man and the cash payment was more important than his relationship with Jesus. But ultimately, the scripture does not provide us with any clear, clear, clear answers. All we know for sure is that when Judas found out that Jesus was going to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray after the supper, he quietly slipped out of the supper party before it was over and then went to the authorities, gave them the information, which led them to the garden to arrest his friend, teacher, and master. And this was the plan all along, a plan to let the guards know when and where to find Jesus so that they could ambush him and bring him in to Pontius Pilate. Now, as a result, though, um, of those actions, that's kind of where Judas has been one of the most familiar disciples to us because uh, that, that story has just brought him to be such a perplexing character um, ever since we probably heard it. Our scriptures then tell us that Judas, after they found out what he was doing to Jesus and what was going to be done, that he felt so guilty about his betrayal that he went back to um, the Jewish authorities and tried to give them back the money. But they didn't want nothing to do with it because Jesus to them was more important than the money. And so he, I watched the movie, so he threw the, the silver coins at them and they wouldn't take it. And he was so bereaved that he went out and ended his life. Now, Jesus had already told him, however, though, um, woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. Now, I think about this a lot, and I'm sure you guys too, but I always imagined, um, like, well, first of all, I always imagined Jesus's last moments being beaten, whipped, um, stoned, kicked. I mean, everything he went through in his last hours. Think about that a lot. But I also think if you kind of reflect, I think about Judas spending his last hours being emotionally, um, psychologically, profoundly in pain, um, being tormented by what he had done to Jesus, even if by some degree you look at it and both he and Jesus knew that it was necessary. You know what I mean? It was the plan of God. Now, Judas Iscariot was the first domino to fall in the sequence of events and characters that led Jesus to the cross. And his fate was just as much left in God's hands as was the fate of Jesus whose journey to the cross was not yet finished, of course. In fact, it was just getting started. Now, a couple of things that we can pick up <clears throat> from the life of Judas Iscariot are this. First of all, we cannot love two gods, okay? Judas claimed to love Jesus, um, but he seemed to have loved money more. Um, God gives us a, a chance to always repent. So Judas could have stopped all of this right there at the supper and, and repented before it got to be too late, before 
handing over Jesus to the authorities. Um, and he had all the time in the world to stop and repent, but he chose not to until it was too late. And we, we all sin, we all do wrong. Um, and we too need to catch our sins and repent before it's too late. Now being in the church, okay, being Christians with the church, okay? It's not a guarantee of salvation, my friends. I mean, look at how Judas Iscariot was. He was one of the 12. Um, it was said that he was one of the trusted ones. You know, him and Jesus had a tight bond. Um, and look at where that got him. Um, God looks at our heart, and I talk about this a lot, but my favorite saying um, of a description of a Christian is a pure heart. And that's what God sees. So if you're out and about doing all these good deeds just to get notification, yada, 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 to look good, to be that, you might as well quit wasting your time. Because if you're not doing those good deeds with a good heart, a good pure heart, it's a waste. Okay? Don't give Satan an inch. Because if you do, he'll take a mile. Judas gave in to the temptation of money and possibly thinking that he would be raised to a different status by siding with the Jewish government. But how well did that work for him? So remember that. And last, our sorrow should lead us to repentance. Now, when Judas found out what was going on, he was in complete pain, sorrow. He was just tormented, like I said, for what he realized that he had done. Right then and there, he had another chance to repent. But instead, he chose to take his life. So just know, my friends, that we all sin. Um, and it's never too late to ask God for forgiveness. Never too late to repent. Okay, so that is our Judas. Um, and with that, we are going to, what did I do that? I was going to tell you the rest of them that we're going to visit. If I can find my book. Let me see if this is the one. Uh, well, we're going to visit... Um, here we go. Um, of course, we're going to visit Pontius Pilate. Again, that's an interesting story. And then Simon Peter, uh, another one that betrayed Jesus. Remember um, when when uh, someone, when Jesus was uh, being beaten and whipped and just the whole kit and caboodle, somebody asked him, aren't you one of him? And he denied Jesus like three times. Um, and then Simon of Cyrene, who was the one that helped Jesus carry his cross. And then, of course, Mary, mother of Jesus. So that's who we're going to visit in the next weeks. All right. So with that, let us all join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord look upon each and every one of you in this whole entire world with his favor and give us all his amazing peace. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made, my friends. Let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Thanks again for joining me, you guys. Um, unfortunately, I will not be on this Friday um, as I have a funeral um, down in Lakota. And so that won't allow me enough time to be on. So... Um, with that, we'll see you next Wednesday. Have a great rest of your week and weekend. And until next week, um, God bless and bye for now.